Hi everybody, it's great to be back here again. It's Friday, Parshat Shalach. Um, this week's portion dealing with the spies. Um, current events, of course, is very connected. We always have this rectification, how we relate to the land of Israel. And I want to talk about the connection between the spies and, and the, the commandment of fringes, tzitziot, which is mentioned at the end of the portion. How do we connect those two topics? In order to do so, we have to go back to the book of Genesis, Bereshit, in chapter 3, and what happens after the first man and, and first woman actually sin by eating from the tree of knowledge? It says right away in verse 7 over there, in chapter 3 again, that their eyes opened up for both of them, and they knew they were naked, and they, and they sewed themselves um, garments, right, out of the leaves of figs, you know, they used them as belts. Um, now, here is fascinating. So the first thing that happens after they sin was sort of an awareness. Now, the word but in Hebrew, vatipakachna, Maimonides explains in the Guide to the Perplex, it's not someone just closing his eyes and opening his eyes all of a sudden. Their eyes were always open, but it's a, it's a realization. They came to a, a, a realization that they were not uh, modest, that they were, they were not dressed, and therefore they felt that they have to do something about the situation, and they covered themselves by making these garments. So the first, um, I would say, meeting that we have in the, in the Bible, in the Torah, with garments is, is, is with, with sin. And after the, you know, what happened, what was the difference between the, before the sin and after the sin? Why all of a sudden now they needed a garment? And, and the commentaries explain in a very, very profound way is that before the sin, you know, we're talking about a situation of total goodness, when people did not yet have that evil urge with inside of them, is that the sexual organs were looked upon as any other organs of the body, that they, they have to do, you know, what, what they have a function to procreate, for example. Someone has, a, you know, has, has hands, he uses them to build, right? Every, every organ of the body has a purpose. So the purpose of, of those organs are to procreate, and it wasn't looked in any way, in a bad way, and they weren't embarrassed in any way, and therefore they were totally naked. The um, Malbim, one of the um, interesting commentaries of the Achorim, he explains something very interesting. He says that the concept, you know, the whole concept of a garment before the sin, they basically, the, the body itself was a garment of the soul, right? So, so the body was sort of separated from the soul. It was very easy for the body to detach and reveal the soul, right? So it did, what happened was, after the sin, he describes it in a very interesting way, is that the body became mingled within the soul. In other words, it entered deeper within us, the evil. And therefore, we need now another garment. But beforehand, since the, since the, the body was like a garment for the soul, it was, it, we didn't need a garment. But now that it, that it went further in, we need an outer garment. So the outer garment, basically is, um, you know, the clothes that we wear. And the first clothes they made were these fig leaves. Um, if we follow that down, it's very interesting in, 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 the, in Genesis, we see that God himself made something else besides that. So if we're looking at that in the chapter, that same chapter, and we go further down to verse number 21, we says, it says, Vayas Hashem elukim, um, le'adam, kotnot ol God made them um, garments of skin. And, he, and, they got, and they got dressed. And that was later on. Now, you could always say, okay, well, all these garments of skin, well, first they had the fig garments. They weren't enough. They didn't last too long. They were like diapers that can fall apart pretty quickly. And they needed something stronger. So God, the Malum explains that God gave them inspiration that they were able to come up with a better, um, a better um, advancement. Um, and they made themselves these, you know, so that he says it wasn't really God went out and, and just made a miracle and made them a, a, a garment of skin, but he, he sort of showed them the way, and they did it. So that's the idea that God made it for them. He opened their eyes in the way they knew how to now go further in, in, um, in scientific advancement and technology, etc. But whatever it is, we see it moving from a fig to skin, and which is really interesting, the Midrash brings down, it's in the Midrash Abba, in the same verse 21 over here, that God made man and woman garments of skin, there, the Midrash brings down in the Sefer Torah of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir was one of the great Tanaim, one of the students of Rabbi Akiva, 
um, right after the destruction of, of the Second Temple. And Rabbi Meir, in his Torah scroll, it says, it said, instead of the ayin, which means all, with an ayin means skin, but if you replace the ayin with an aleph, it means light. So God made them garments of light and he dressed them. Now, what is Rabbi Meir trying to teach us? I mean, you know, we all have the same Torah scroll. But in reality, we see that the letter Aleph and Ayin are interchangeable. They're guttural letters coming from the throat. It depends how deep we say. We say Ayin or Aleph, right? It's a little... It's, Aleph is not as deep as the Ayin. But they're very, very similar. And therefore, which is fascinating, is that Rabbi Meir is talking about an, a, a future situation when we reach the final uh, redemption, the Tikkun HaShalem, eventually that skin garment will become now a garment of light again because... In the Garden of Eden, our garments were light. We didn't need a physical garment, right? But we needed, we need, but at that, because that moment we were totally divorced of the evil urge. But once we sin now, that entered, entered us, our whole lives changed. Now, if you look at the word um, all um, in Hebrew, which means skin, if you reverse the letters, it means zoroah, evil. So the same letters for evil. In other words, this whole situation now, in our period of time, we have to rectify ourselves. We are dealing with the evil that surrounds us. This whole sin of the, um, you know, the sin of the of the what's it called, eating from the apple. Well, it's really eating from the fig. That's why it was revealed eating from the fig tree, according to one opinion. But eating from the tree of knowledge, that whole process of sinning and all that. That brought about our 6,000 years of rectification. We have to rectify the sin. And going back to the, the, pre, the pre-sin situation of the garments of light. And we have to eventually shed off these external garments. And here is really going to bring us to, to the point I want to try to make about our portion. Is that people, in the, if we look around in the world today and we see where do people struggle? Where do people fall into the wrong side, the dark side, or fall off the way, is how they view things. It's all about the view of different things. How do we, how do we look at things? And there's nothing, no more of a greater example of the sin of the spies. When the sin of the spies, um, when they came to the land of Israel, I mean, they were looking at the same things as Kalev and Joshua were looking at. They were looking at the same exact thing. But it's all what you stress and how you relate to that. Now, how, what emphasis do you put on what you see? And that's really the entire, the entire um, rectification process we have to go through. Is what our conception is, what our, how do we view things? And we always have to look beyond the surface. We're looking at the external surface. What is a garment? A garment is extremely um, misleading in a way. Because a garment takes you away from the, what's inside. So a person can dress up with these really fancy clothes and looks like, like some kind of fancy professor or p- fancy, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and then he can dress up with working clothes. He looks like some kind of plumber. And then he can dress up with a different kind of outfit. He looks like a doctor. A different kind of outfit. He's going to look like um, a painter. You know, your garments really could lie about who you are. You just put those garments on and you're someone else. So, there, of course, the most important thing is what is below the surface, what is in there? What is the deep meaning behind the garment? And what's fascinating in Hebrew, if we look, the words, many of the words that mean a garment in Hebrew um, reflect this concept of sort of seeing only the surface, it's sort of rebellion, it brings us back to the sin. And I'd like to bring down some of those, some of those words there, you know, very, very... Famous, but we'll go over them again. I'm sure you all know some of those words. And we'll begin by saying beged. What does beged in Hebrew mean? Beged comes from the word Hebrew meaning bagad, means to rebel. So a garment means to rebel. The same thing, the word me'il, a jacket in Hebrew, comes from me'ilah or ma'al. It means when someone embezzles to do, when someone does something, um, how would I say, embezzlement, you know, someone who's, someone who's, this is not honest. So, me'il is also, again, a form of, uh, a form of rebellion, of course. Me'ila. The same way, if we look at, we'll look at another word way of reflecting um, a garment, the word levush. Levush comes from the Hebrew root, meaning to be embarrassed, right? This is what we spoke about here with the sin of the first man and, and the first woman here. 
So again, when someone does something wrong, they're embarrassed, right? The embarrassment. So garment is always bringing us back and reminding us whether it's some kind of rebellion or different forms of embarrassment or me'il. It's also interesting, another interesting word brought down in the Torah, um, which is called salma. A salma is a dress. So it's like, a, again, it doesn't have to be a woman's dress. In those days, they would wear, it could be a, a male or a woman garment called a salma. And I thought it's interesting, the salma is, has within it the letters, the, the, sal, the sin, which sounds like samech, which they're interchangeable, and the mem there, like samach mem. <laughs> samach mem all reminds us of the sitra achra. It's another name for the sitra achra, the dark side. So within that word also, there's a hint to the dark side over there. Garments are bring us right back to the sin of, of the first man. They all remind us of that, of that terrible, terrible sin, and that changed the whole entire world. Now, what's fascinating is that connected to this portion, in our portion that deals with the sin of the spies, which it was, which is, which they saw again. They saw the same thing that Joshua and Caleb saw, but it was their interpretation. Looking at the external things, they were afraid of the giants in the land, they were afraid of, of, of having to deal and cope with the battles, there was a lot of work involved, right? So they said, which was really fascinating, if you look in the, the verse which talks about that whole story of the, of the sin of the spies, there's a verse that really stood out. And I would like to um, quote that verse to you all. And that has to do with the, um, the way they viewed, the way they viewed um, themselves in the eyes of the giants in the land. And the verse says right out, what do they say if you recall the verse? They say that they looked at us as Chagavim. Right? We, were, we were, in their eyes, they looked at themselves as like locusts, like a little like insects, basically, in their eyes. And then it says in that same verse that that's the way the giants viewed them as well. They viewed them as locusts. So it's interesting. How do we know how they viewed us? We can say, okay, we viewed ourselves in their eyes as locusts. But how do we know that they viewed, they viewed us that same way, that they looked at us as locusts in the eyes? And there are other commentaries explained different ways, and I thought of something that in my eyes it, made, it makes sense to connect what we're saying, is that the way they view something, right? They, they, they have this whole concept based on their wild imagination that they were like these insects, and they would, like, compare to them, right? So then the others view them the same way. They bring it upon the, the, the judgment on themselves in that same way. And that's, of course, a false conception. They, they, they had this whole conception that they believed that they were nothing. They couldn't deal they couldn't, they couldn't deal with these giants in the land. After we know that God promises the land, we're going to be able to conquer the land. As Caleb and Joshua come along and saying, Alo na right? We will surely go up because we can do this and the land is, 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 is good, very good. Tovah is mod mode. So the entire struggle here between the sin of the spies and the, those who were able to overcome, Caleb and Joshua, was how to view, if we can look at the external things, are we going to be afraid of the land? They try to show the fruit, how the fruit was so large and large. And they try to turn everything around. Instead of looking at that, that cup and saying it's half full, right? The positive attitude, they're looking at the pessimistic attitude, it's half empty. Always finding fault in the, in the you know, in everything and trying to portray in a whole different understanding of, of looking at the land of Israel. Now, of course, what, what were they so invested in this, in this sin? And the answer is, is they didn't want the challenge. They were happy in the desert. They were happy. They, they wanted to go back to Egypt with the field of Egypt. They were worried about the challenge to go ahead. We have to fight for a land. We have a lot of work to do. Right? We have to have Mesut Nefesh. We have to give for ourselves. It requires effort. But at the end, it's going to bring us the highest possible spiritual um, blessing that we can possibly fathom. But they weren't willing to give it the shot. You know, that's the whole thing. The conception was totally warped. And this concept, I thought, is very, very, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of their other sources that can bring down. I don't want to, you know, overextend now, but... I will quote one other source just to show you what I'm talking about. Um, I thought of a very interesting idea here. And if we look in the, in the Bible, the Bible mentions the 
seven different kings. Bela ben Beor, Yovav ben Zerach, the kings that were king, the kings, the Edomite kings. And when it talks about the names of the Edomite kings, it mentions one of the kings, which are the, I would call the fifth, if you go in the order, Bela, Yovav, Husham, Hadad is called Simla, Salam, Samla, right? Samla is really like Simla, a garment, which is, like I said before, the Samach Mem. Right, the Samach Mem is the dark side. And here we see the, the concept of garment again coming up with the kings, the Edomite kings. The Edomite kings, we know, is the battle we have throughout our 6,000 years of, of, of this historical world we're in to rectify the world. And, and the fifth one, which is Samla, Samla, the name of the king is, is that garment, stands out. What, what's special about the fifth level? The fifth level as we all know, represents the level of Hod on the Sfirot. Hod refers to a garment. As we know, it's brought down in Psalms number 104. It says, um, um, King David says, you know, let him bless Hashem, his soul. And um, Hod it says, Hod Vashta. You are, you are dressed with hod and hadal, with um, glory and splendor. So that same exact concept of hod, you know, that same, the number of the fifth level here, referring to the king of the Edomite king, um, we always have zeh keneged zeh, right? One, we have two sides, the dark side as opposed to the, the rectification. And here King David, who represents, obviously, the, the malchut, the kingship, to rectify all the uncleanliness in the world and to turn things around is talking about the Hod, right? God, you know, we want to get to that tikkun of Hod, of splendor, of the light of Hashem to reveal and, and, and to remove the, the darkness of the false garments, of, the, of, again, Samla, right? That king of darkness, which means a dress, which is just covering over. It's like a, a garment, it's a barrier between us and God and, and we want to reveal that barrier. It gets a little deep, but I'm just trying to show you how that point is so, it's just so powerful, it stands out so well. But even more so than this, if we take this concept and re regarding garments, and I want to connect it with another location, is when we see that Judah, when Judah, as we all know, sinned, right? When he, as we all know with the story with Joseph was sold, and then right after that it says, Judah went down. Why did he go down for? Well, he goes on the way, and then he forgot about his daughter-in-law that needed to get a yibum, right? Because his sons, um, you know, passed away, and he was supposed to give her another son in order to do the the marriage, the special marriage that's done, in order to um, fulfill his promise to his daughter-in-law, and he forget, and he forgets about her. So that was a, he forgot was forgetfulness, whatever it was, and. What does she do? She goes ahead and she dresses up like a harlot. And it says, we look in Genesis 38, verse number 14, what does it say? It says she removed her, her widow garments and she put upon and she put on herself a tseif, like a some kind of um, scarf, and she stood at the, the gate of the Petach Einayim. It's very interesting. She stood at the, the entrance of Einaim. Einaim could be the name of a place, or it literally means eyes. It could also mean a spring, right? Petach Einaim. And which is fascinating. It's sort of hinting to the way you view things. And she was sort of covered over and hiding herself. And, and Judah thought that this was a, a, a harlan, and he took her. And later on, she disappears. We all we know what happens over there. And out of that relationship... Judah, of course, um, apologized that he made a mistake and he totally forgot what he did and he admits to his, his um, sinning to her. And what is born out of that, a child is born out of that relationship. Twins are born and one of them is named Peretz. And Peretz, of course, from if we look at the lineage in, the, in Megillat Torut, which we just read recently on um, Chag Shavod, what does it say in chapter um, 4? It says, Ve'elit toldot Peretz, these are the generations of Peretz, and we go down the line, and then if you look in verse number um, 20, it says, V'aminadav olidet nachshon, v'nachshon olidet salma, right? 
נחשון um, gave birth to Salma. Salma is very similar to כן, Simla, the letters just turn around. Here, unlike Simla, which the Mem comes before the Lamed, the Lamed comes before the Mem. So I said when the Mem comes before the Lamed, right, that would be the Samach Mem, the dark side. But here, it refers to rectifying the sin. So it's, it's it, the same letters as Shlomo, meaning wholeness. Um, and that is rectifying already the whole concept of, of the garment. The garment means to hide. And here we see that the, to forget, to forget who's above, to forget your promises and all that. And here, out of this, of course, King David is born, Messiah is born. So it's fascinating to see that same connection, those same letters of how King David came out of this relationship of in the beginning, the mistake was made with the garments again. She covered herself over. He was covered over. And then the re- revelation took place, which is fascinating. Now, with this in mind, and we can go on to a lot of other sources, but I want to try to um, get right now to the, you know, to the summer, to summarize things over here. With this understanding, if we look at the, at the portion of tzitzit, what is unique about the whole mitzvah of wearing tzitzit? And where is tzitzit? Is really, um, you know, the, the Torah, well, the Talmud, full of our sources, praises greatly the tzitzit as being if someone as being if someone wears a garment of tzitzit, it's like they're fulfilling all the commandments in the Torah. That's how important the mitzvah is. As we know now in battle in Israel, even not secular Jews, there are so many Jews now walking around with the tzitzit. Now everyone is wearing tzitzit. It's like a big thing in Israel now. And that sort of the tzitzit really leads us, you know, brings us back to the whole rectification of what we're talking about the entire way. And and I want to show, you know, I want to give some now examples to show, you know, to show this concept. Now, if you look at a garment, the garment itself is made of, you know, strands of, of strings, right? Here, here's one string of my tzitzit. Oh, let's look at the blue one, the trailer. So one string put together with another one, put together with another one, put together with another one, eventually we are creating this garment, right? So a garment is made out of many, many strings. But what happens is you put all the strings together into a garment, the garment blocks, becomes something that you can't see through anymore. You can't, because now that when it comes together, it creates some kind of, we say, masach, like a barrier, a um, some kind of of blockage, right? It's, you can't see, you know, a garment is very you can't see through when all the strings are put together. But when they're separate, and if you have, for example, if you ever saw, you know, seen those um, people put like beads, strings of beads down of beads, and you enter a certain door, and then you could see through it, really see through. That's really the one of the I thought of a, this idea, um, but I came to it through a commentary called the um, Kliyakal. And he writes about something else that, that with one mitzvah, one string, one mitzvah could do so much to cleanse a person's, person's soul. He gives it another kind of example. And then, then this, through that, I was, through when I was reading his words, I said, wait, you know something? I, I, you, know, this is, you can also learn, you know, learn this concept I'm trying to show to you now, is that the fact is that you can see through the tzitzit. Why? Because the whole idea of a tzitzit God says, Uritemoto, you must look at them, right? But in a different kind of looking. Not just to look at the external. The idea is to see through this. Where does this take us to? What, what is the deep, the depth behind the tzitzit? And that's really the deep concept of the tzitzit. If, if the strings were, were all um, attached and, and sewn together, we wouldn't be able to see anything. The idea is we'd be able, we have to distinguish between the blue and the white threads, right? It's very important. We have to look through this. We have to um, raise our awareness. And this is brought down, fascinating, and the Talmud talks about how, maybe I'll quote quickly, a Talmudic passage, it talks about the, um, the tzitziot itself, that how, um, I'll just quickly read this to you all. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll read this. Let me read it. So it's brought down in Sanhedrin, it's brought down, I'm sorry, Menachot, in, chapter, in page 43. And it says, "Uitemoto uzechaltem et kol mitzvot Hashem." You will look at the tzitzit and you will remember all the commandments of God, 
And the, and, the, and the Talmud says, Shkula, this is based on a Brayta, in an ancient source, Shkula mitzvah zo connected kol mitzvot kulan. This commandment is, is like paramount of doing all the commands of the Torah. Um, another one, another, mitzvah, another thing is brought down. It says, you will look at the tzitzit and you remember, it says, if you're looking at something, eventually you'll become to remember. And and if you, and if you remember something, then you will come to doing it. In other words, the whole idea, and the Rashbi goes on to say, let's continue the Brayta, anyone who is quick in fulfilling the mitzvah says, Zochel mekabel he's able to literally bring down the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence. So, fascinating, the mitzvah tzidah is connected to all the mitzvot, to awaken us, to remind us, to let us leave the external conception and go to the internal conception. There's another in that same tractate in Menachot, in the same area, the Talmud says, Rabbi Meir, that same Rabbi Meir, as he said before, who looks inside the Torah, and he says, instead of this, the ayin, it's, a, it's an aleph, or, meaning light, he says, Manishtanat chelet mekol What's so special about the blue color here, and the tzitzit? And he's saying, Mipnei doma leyam. The tchelet is likened to the sea. And the sea is likened to the firmament, and the firmament is like to the thro- likened to the throne, God's throne. So we, we're here. In other words, the mitzvah is supposed to take us all the way from the lowest places, the sea. Right? The sea is also the same letters in Hebrew. Yam is me. Me in Hebrew means who? Who am I? Right? From we have to ask ourselves who we are, and we have to begin in the lowest places. Right, the, the water always collects in the lowest area from the sea. From there we have to rise. We're rising first above to the sky, from the sky we're going all the way above to God's holy throne. Of course, these are spiritual levels. Um, and the spiritual level of the throne of Hashem is when we begin to totally disengage from our external, from our false conceptions, from our just reading the surface and going deeper and deeper and then we reveal the highest plane of the divine throne. That is really our, our goal here. Through the mitzvah of, of tzitzit, it brings us to that great concept. As I said, we have to see through. These strings, we can see through them, they're, right? They're not wrapped together and has to bring us. Not only that, the tzitzit are also sort of on the end, on the fringes, right? They're on the sides of our garment. Realizing that the garment is in, here is all closed, right? But when we are at Tzitziot, it, be, it opens up on the bottom to realize that we want to eventually shed our, our, our barriers and reveal what's behind them. That's really this great concept. With that concept in mind, we understand that the sin of the spies and next week's portion also, the sin of Korach, is, is all centered around the Tzitzit because if you're not looking in the deep side and you're looking at the external, what happens when you look at external things? You look at yourself, your ego, it all, it's all about you, and you don't see the truth, and then you're taken in by the false conception. And this is exactly what happened with the spies. They had their own personal reasons, they had bad motives when they came to see the land of Israel, and therefore they weren't successful. Right? Eventually, those who come with the, with the bad intentions and bad deeds, that will fall apart. Eventually, the, the Caleb's and Joshua's, they will succeed. Although it's a difficult battle, but that will overcome. That's the rectification we saw with King David. Which is also fascinating. You know, King David rips the garment of, of Saul. He rips that garment. In the cave, when he went to show that he was there, ripping the garment, David was punished for ripping the garment of Malchut, of the kingship, which was really interesting. Because the garment itself is something that God says, we want to take that garment. We don't have no need to rip that garment. We want to turn that garment into something that we can see through it, to separate the garment into strings. And the strings will be able to climb high and eventually see through and get up. The garment, like a string, sometimes you pull yourself up to a high place. We have to do snappling and get ourselves up to a much higher plane. It's really interesting. The concept, how King David is so connected to the garments, we see it in other ways as well with Joseph. I'm not going to go there now. But this concept is extremely powerful. Now, just before we end here, 
I'm just touching again the surface. I want to mention one other thing we see in this portion. Um, in addition to the story of the spies, in addition to this tzitzit, we see the, what we call the wine libation, right? Nisachim, which is brought down the meal offering, the wine. Now those seem to be, it, it's perfectly in line with what we're talking about because the, the bringing the nisachim, when a person brings an offering, for example, like a peace offering or a, or a ola or a burnt offering or a sin offering, so they brought together nisachim with it. These nisachim, were like you can say in the, on, on one hand they were like the side things they were like by the way I'm going to bring something in additional but in reality those were the, the, the well, those are the most important things but a lot of times people take those things on the side like the tzitziot they're hanging down below and they okay those are not so important they want to show off the fact the sacrifice that they brought they want to look again at the you know they're looking at the external things more God says I don't want you know he, when, he, when God gives us reproof Isaiah talks about it and many other places in the Bible, that God prefers our hearts, our inner you know, soul, much more than the external things that we're doing. Of course, we have to do the mitzvot externally, but we have to really, what's behind that? And that's really what the wine is all about, the wine, bringing the wine and the offerings. Um, our rabbis bring down a, fa- a fascinating midrash with Jacob. We know that when Jacob comes back, after being outside of Israel 22 years, and he, he goes to Beit El to thank God, right? And why don't we look at the verse? It's brought down in Genesis 35, verse 14, and it says, Vayatsev Yaakov Matseva, and Jacob said, Sebevi, a Matseva, um, which is a monument, right, of stone, basically setting up a stone. Bamakoma Shediberito Matsevet Aven. He sets up a stone, like an altar of some kind. Vayasecha Leanesech. There it says he brought down, he, he poured the wine libation there, and he poured over oil. And he called that place that he spoke to in Beit El, the house of God. Now, here, which is fascinating, is that it doesn't mention any sacrifice. He just talks about the nesach, the, the wine. And the reason it doesn't talk about sa- bringing sacrifices down is because here it's shown that Jacob, Jacob was coming back to the land and showing his, his appreciation to God for, for, for bringing him back from the exile, bringing him back to the land of Israel, that, that Jacob's focus was on always on the little details. Right? Always on the things that people push aside. The nesach. That people forget to be thankful. People forget to show appreciation. And those little things is really what makes and breaks us. We have to pay attention to the little things and that will brings us much more, much higher awareness. And the nesach represents that modesty, the things that are on the side, that at the end the most important thing sometimes. And that connects to the whole concept we're talking about over here in the portion. Well, to wrap it up, <laughs> because again, there's an expression, we are we're finishing, but we're not completing. You know, there's a lot more to discuss here and much more depth, but to try to take these concepts to heart and realizing that how important the commandment of tzitziot are is supposed to waken up our, you know, wake, to wake us up, to waken up our vision. Um, as we know, it says, in this, in, it says in the Song of Songs regarding... Um, the word tzitzit, it says, mitzitz min acharakim, he's looking through the cracks, right? So tzitzit is actually doing that. We're looking through the little cracks. Sometimes there's little cracks of light that come through, and that can open you all the doors for you in the world by looking through those little cracks. And that exactly is what this is all about, to go through those garments, to go through those barriers, and to connect to the highest places. And this will allow us to read the situation, reality, a much deeper way to give us tremendous encouragement and inspiration and not to fall into pessimism and external things which are totally overtaking those who are don't, not showing their faith in God. And this will bring us about our true salvation. Bezrat Hashem. Shabbat Shalom. Besarot. Tovot. Yeshuot v'nechamot.